Well, hello everyone and welcome to our High Noon broadcast. This is Jason Sisko and we are excited to share with you another edition of Triumph Today. This is a part of our international network. Triumph Ministries International Network serves our global community. And it's also an extension of our local church, the Church Triumphant, here in Pasadena, Texas, where we serve as lead pastors. And very thankful to have such a tremendous team of amazing pastors, disciple makers, intercessors. We have some of the most incredible people um, in the world that call the Church Triumphant their church home family. And we welcome all of you who are born of the water and born of the spirit. We're so thankful for all of our consistent uh, intercessors that join with us every single week and excited always to have the many countries that join with us as well. So we welcome you uh, to another edition. I'm here at my home office and excited to share some things with you today that I think will be encouraging to you and will also be uh, preparing. And welcome San Diego. So glad uh, that you're joining with us today. I uh, love San Diego and uh, had a chance to travel into a lot of places. San Diego's a great place, but they need revival just like every other place. Wisconsin, we welcome you. Of course, I was raised there and that's always great to, to hear. I know Hawaii coming in. Uh, we're just gonna hang loose with you today and pray the prayer of faith with you that God's gonna bring revival all around the world. We see Michigan uh, joining in, Germany joining in again with us. I just talked to our missionary there a couple of days ago. And of course, uh, Canada joining in, Tennessee, so many people, Columbus, Ohio, where my family uh, resides now, my father and my mother are there. What a great, great, great place. Of course, my sisters and all, all my family. I'm the Texas Cisco's. So, uh, but today, uh, we just wanna open our hearts and open our spirits and be so thankful for the opportunity uh, to join with all of our brothers and sisters, all the pastors and teachers, all the evangelists, everyone that joins with us, not only live, but also when you can join with us, all the outside walkers that listen and pray and walk through the neighborhood, everyone that drives in their cars and listens uh, and prays along with us, those that are connected with us right now. We today are preparing ourselves. This is a time of preparation for the body of Christ as we are shifting gears in the month of August. We are going to see much more political intensity showing up over the next couple of weeks. We will have, um, with that, I think, some more uh, demonstrations and protests that will be happening uh, just as a part of the uh, wanting to get attention for their particular issues as we are counting down towards election times. We are still dealing with the coronavirus uh, complication in our lives, to call it that, and uh, just I was on the phone yesterday with more that were just diagnosed, so we feel it here, and I'm sure that you're feeling it where you are. Um, and of course, if you're part of Church Triumphant family, you know someone and you're praying for someone right now. But God is faithful, and he's helping people to recover, and I think that's also very important for, for, for the world to know that not only are there people being infected, but the majority of people are recovering and coming out of it. But we want to pray, of course, around those issues. Um, we also sense that there is going to be a ramping up of spiritual intensity where there will be demonic and uh, different kinds of issues. So I want to kind of open up today with us just praying uh, a prayer of just uh, alignment with God. We do this every day, every time we're together, of alignment and rhythm, alignment and rhythm. And we're just asking God to help us to stay in step with him and to not let fear govern our lives. Father, we come to you today. We thank you for all who have uh, joined in with us. And we're so thankful, God, whether it's the Midwest or the West Coast or the East Coast or whether it's somewhere here in the South or in Texas. God, we're so thankful for all of our all of our partners that are connecting with us for North America, Central America. We have Europe that connects with us. Africa's connecting with us. Sometimes we even have Asia uh, connecting in with us. But we're, we're thankful, God, 
God, that there are people all around the world that are so vigilant, that are so dedicated, that are so committed. We thank you, God, for worshipers because you are looking for worshipers. And I know your eyes, they go to and fro in the earth to show yourself strong to those whose heart is made perfect towards you. And so today we want our hearts to be perfect. We want our minds to be submitted. We want, oh God, to be transformed today by the renewing of our minds. We know, Lord, every day, oh God, is a day that we must serve you. Every day you need us, oh God, to faithfully express the light that you have given to us in a dark world. We must love, oh God, in the face of those whose hearts are becoming hardened. Oh God, we must give, oh God, in a world, Lord Jesus, where many people are just focused on themselves. Oh God, we must speak peace where there is confusion. We must speak faith where there is fear. But first, oh God, we must get our strength from you. We must come into your presence today. And so we pray, Lord, spirit and soul and body would be set aside, set apart and sanctified, that we would be meat for the master's use, that we would be, oh God, uh, pliable, oh God, that we would be, we would be humble, that we would be able, Lord Jesus, to adapt and to adjust and that we will be immediately obedient in Jesus' name. Strengthen my will to be obedient to your voice in Jesus' name. We thank the Lord for that. Now let's let's pray the armor on together. We take our loins good about with truth. We take on the breastplate of righteousness, the feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Now we confess the seven spirits of God will we'll guide us and direct us as they did Jesus. He passes them to us through uh, our redemption and through our covenant relationship. We have access now to the whole counsel of God. And so we pray in Jesus' name for the spirit of the Lord, that we would have mastery in our lives, that you would cause us, oh God, to be temperate in all things and strive for the mastery. We pray for wisdom and understanding to be perfectly balanced in our lives, in Jesus' name. We pray for counsel, strategy, clarity, plans, counsel, and might, oh God, that goes with uh, the insight of, of how we go to war and then the might to execute the plan. We thank you, Lord, for knowledge. We thank you, Lord, for supernatural knowledge and for the fear of the Lord, and that the fear of the Lord brings us in that humility of knowing what we don't know in Jesus' name. So these become our balances, and we ask you, God, that we would be directed and guided by the whole counsel of God in our lives in Jesus' name. Everybody say, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. So I've talked about this consistently, and I'm just going to bring it again to you today. And we're going to just talk about one aspect of it. But as I was coming into 2010, I did an extended fast and asked the Lord for direction. And he said, don't ask me for a year, but rather ask me for a decade. I want to speak to you in decades. And so he told me about the next decade, and I didn't even realize what he was saying, is that he was actually talking to me about 20 years and not 10 years, because he used the word decades. I was thinking that it would be an increment of 10 at a time that he would show me, but what he was saying and what I was understanding is that there would be a bridge between the decade that was coming of preparing ourselves and that I needed to hear clearly what God was saying, and I needed to be ready for what God was about to do in the earth. And so I had several different uh, uh, times when God visited me and talked to me, but there were two particular times uh, in which I have begun over the last 10 years to really prepare because I was, I was uh, anticipating those things happening between 2010 and 2020. But I realize now, as I came to the end of 2019, God began to speak to me again as I was asking him about it. And he said, he said, I told you next decade, not this decade. I gave you 10 years to get ready for it. So now what he said for this decade, which when he was first referring to it, it was 10 years to come. So coming into 2020, he said that things would begin to move very, very fast. He said, if you thought they moved fast coming in, uh, from the 2000s into 2010, if you thought that was fast, he said it would be nothing compared to how fast things would move starting in 2020. And so he said, you're going to have to change your systems. 
You're going to have to change your structures and you're going to have to adapt to new ways of thinking for the speed of change that is happening in the world. And he, and he brought me to the, to the thought process of Jeremiah that said, if you are running with the footmen and they weary you, who's going to help you when the horsemen come? And so, and I'm just paraphrasing there, but he's basically saying is that, is that if you're running and you're just with, the, with, with, with those that are running a marathon, and then all of a sudden, here comes a cavalry. A, a, a cavalry riding in with their horses is going to be much more efficient and going to be able to ride so much longer for so much farther. And he said, if you're wore out just running, how are you going to run uh, and keep up with the horses? And so he's basically saying to us is that, is that you're running now, but you're going to need something to help help you. You're going to need a horse. You're going to need something else to, to expedite and to move you forward. And so this is new systems, new thoughts. And of course, when you come into the, the last days, what does the book of Revelation tell us? It tells us what? That there are horsemen that are going to be released in the earth. And so this is also a window into the end times of where we're going into the era of the horsemen or the apocalypse or the end of days. And so we have to adjust ourselves. That's why yesterday I talked to you about it's time to get tough. We have to toughen up a little bit. And, and you know what? All of us Americans, Westerners, we tend to be a little soft. And so we're used to our comforts and a slight little thing is off and we complain and complain. And we, we really don't know how most of the rest of the world lives. Uh, until you travel outside of the United States and see what a third world country is like, what billions of people who have never seen a computer or live hand to mouth from their rice fields right to their doorstep, not even in the economy at all. Uh, and for us who are just so spoiled uh, that we complain over the smallest things, uh, we have to adjust our thinking a little bit and endure hardness as a good soldier. But we have to also adjust our thinking and our strategy and allow God to give us a horse, in essence. So an, a second part of this is that he told me that there was a shift that was coming uh, where we were seeing what we would know as conservatism beginning to go away because there was a, a, a kind of a wide-scale teaching uh, from uh, preschool all the way through university that there's a whole new system of thought that has been pumped in uh, a whole new ideology that this generation coming coming up they do not have context to the same things that maybe the World War II generation did when they influenced the baby boomers uh, or when they in in influenced the Gen Xers and so that generation the greatest generation that they call it is faded away and we don't understand values we don't understand uh, freedom we don't understand democracy we don't understand capitalism we don't understand personal responsibility we don't understand freedom we don't understand rights uh, it just seems to be a lot of emotion and very much living in the moment. Uh, very little context of history is even being taught and even being understood right now. And so he said that there would be a, a shift that would become anti-Bible. It would become anti-Christian, anti-church. And with that, uh, there would be persecution that would come. And so he said they're going to bring in a very secular mindset into America and into and into the Western thought, it, they would bring in just this wave, uh, uh, this this wave of of of, and I I don't know what else to call it. I'm not being political. I just it's an ideology uh, of liberalism, uh, and what that means. It's basically open to everything, uh, and very little uh, very little sense of absolute truth, and so this this uh, goes directly against what the Word of God is. The Word of God is forever settled in heaven is that it's not what I think about it, what you think about it, it's what God says that is. It's like gravity. Gravity is whether you acknowledge it or not. Well, I just don't believe in gravity. Well, guess what? You're going to fall and you're going to be pulled down. And whether you agree with gravity or not, if you jump off a cliff, uh, you're probably going to die. So, you know, these are the things, these are established laws. And so there is a, there is a lot of antichrist system that is being brought into the world today that, that is preaching another Jesus and is preaching another gospel. And, uh, and so as such, uh, there's going to even be people that think they're doing God's service uh, when they persecute the church. So some other things that God said to me is that it would be a part of that is that there would be a change in institutionalized uh, religion. 
is that there would be uh, established churches, there would be established organizations, there would be acceptable places where people could go on a Sunday morning to a building and have a service. But there would be a lot of uh, of things that would come directly against the church that would decentralize it and would push it out into homes and push it out into house churches. And so he said there would be a grassroots movement that would have a that would have a flame of revival that would spread all around the world and that nothing and no one would stop it. These were prophetic words that God gave me over 10 years ago. And I've been trying to prepare myself for this, think through these layers and understand them. And now that we're being pressed and we're moving and things are changing and we're coming into this arena, we, we are seeing this. A fourth thing was that the Alpha Cities would be reached. And that was a separate encounter that I had, which I've talked to you about before. So I do believe that there's going to be an extensive and great outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Now, here's the point that I want to focus on again today, is that he said that persecution was coming. He said, but there would be a space of grace. There would be a space. And depending, this is what he said, how fervent the church prays and how effectual the church is in their praying would determine that time frame, how long the reprieve is. So I'm going to give you some scriptures to pray again today about how to uh, extend our reprieve and why. And then we're also going to talk about the concept and the principle of persecution just for a little bit and what that means to us already now, what is already happening to us now, not even just what's coming, but what's already happening now. And I want you to help you to get your mind around this and not necessarily uh, look at it from a totally negative perspective but that this is a uh, part of how the kingdom of God uh, operates in this context of contradiction in the earth. Okay, so first let's look at our let's look at our motivation and our case to pray for peace in the world. So we go to uh, a classic verse which I have referenced before, and we're going to look at it again today. First uh, Timothy two. Now there are four. Uh, different channels of prayer, to use that terminology, uh, that are that are used here, at least four supplications. He said, I exhort there that first of all, in other words, this is your priority. More than anything, Timothy, this is the priority. So this is why we pray, because the Bible says it's first of all. His house is not a house of preaching. It's not a house of disciple making. It's not a house of fellowship. It is a house of prayer first. Everything connects to prayer first. I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercession, and giving of thanks be made for all men. Now, what does this mean? Supplications mean the law of first order would be the highest level. So let's go through these quickly. For those of you that have heard this before, it'll be a nice refresher. For those that have never heard this, this will help you. So the first When you first enter this channel of prayer, there is an entry level, and then the deeper you go into it, it goes to an extreme. So let's talk about the entry level for each one and then the extreme, okay? So uh, the progression, in other words, of that level of prayer, that kind of prayer, so um, or that type. I, I talk about two kinds of prayer, which is immediate prayer and a long term or uh, memorial praying. So there's some prayers that need answers right now, and there's some that we pray over a period of time that are memorial. But then there's different types of praying that we do, whether it's for right now or whether it's for something down the road. So supplications, let's talk about it just as a channel. You tune into this. It's praying with tears. Is that when the tears begin to flow, this is a place of humility, of hum- of brokenness. It's a place of surrender. It's a place of expression of your emotion. And this is a very high level because when you are crying and praying, that means you are fully engaged. Your heart is involved. It's very difficult to cry and be distracted. If you are crying, you are feeling something. You are focused. There is there is an issue, there is something there that is creating some kind of pain or some kind of angst 
or some kind of pressure or some kind of deep moving of your compassion or your heart. So we're praying with tears. This used to be my goal in every prayer that I would pray until I would cry because it would be like when I would cry, that meant I, I broke through, I got to the tenderness, I got to the presence of God, I got past all of the distractions. That means I'm fully there in the presence of God and I've, and I've really, really prayed today. Uh, but there is a progression of supplications is that, is that progression of supplication leads to a higher level of intensity. And you see this with Hannah. She prayed until she couldn't speak. She wept until she couldn't speak. And then it was the deep anguish. And what does that take us to? Travail. It is the giving of birth. And so supplications ultimately leads us to travail. Now, all the women out there understand that you cannot travail and give birth every single day. It just cannot happen. And so it, supplications is, is a high level because you literally give birth to something that you are changed. You are transformed by what happens in that moment. But it is so, uh, it is so intense, it's not something that you do on the highest level, highest extreme every single day. Uh, prayers. Secondly, prayers. This is different. This is almost the antithesis of supplications. This is uh, this is a, a this is a, a level of prayer that has very little feeling with it. This is deep fellowship communion praying. This is that this is that talking to God and sharing your heart with Him. But this is it may lead into supplications. But this actual channel is much more around the friendship and relationship and fellowship and communication. So the entry level for this would just be very honest. God, I'm having a hard day today. Today I'm feeling very tired. You know, I'm just I'm just a little bit distracted. This is praying. This is that dimension of just relationship with God. But I want to talk to you today. I want to open my heart to you. I want to get in the spirit. I want to hear your voice. But I'm just showing you where I'm at, Father. I'm acknowledging you. So this is what we're doing when we're praying. Now, where it goes in its extreme place is a place of hearing God in a very deep and intimate level is that while you're in that moment, you get you get more and more transparent. You get deeper and deeper in the intimacy until there is that awesome presence of God that we're walking with God. And the Bible says Enoch walked with God and he was not for God took him. He got so deep into praying that God just took him. Intercessions. Now, intercession is standing between and mediating. That's what intercession is. To intercede means I am accepted, um, I have access, but someone else does not. And so I am uh, first interceding to God. God receives me. He accepts me. I have relationship with him. I'm already seated with him in heavenly places. And so I can come and talk to him. And because of my relationship with him, he will hear me when I talk about someone else. And so this is, the, this is what intercession is, to intercede, to stand between, is that Abraham, as the friend of God, now was in this deep level of intimacy. He gets his prayer answered. God tells him, next year you're going to have a son, just like I told you. Sarah laughs, and he says, I heard you laughing in there. Oh, no, no, they're having this moment. And then finally God tells him, okay, it's time for me to go. And when he goes, now he walks with him and that revelation knowledge is flowing out of that intimacy and he comes into intercession now. And in intercession, he says, I'm going to Sodom. And he literally, the, the Hebrew says he got in God's face. He literally stood face to face with God and stopped him. No, no, wait, before you go, before you go, let me, let me stop you and intercede for those people. And so that's the first thing we stand between. It is to make up the gap. There's a gap somewhere to, to, to stand and make up the hedge. There's, a, there's somewhere the protection has been broken. And so that's intercession. The second part of intercession would go, it would go into, uh, into spiritual warfare. Here we are not, we are not just asking God and, and imploring God and, and asking for favor for someone or for forgiveness or for mercy. But now we also turn and we see how Satan is walking through that breach, how he is how he's gotten into that gap and what he is doing to torment those people or to afflict those people. And so now we are interceding in spiritual warfare we're standing against in Jesus' name. And this goes into full-on warfare. There may be uh, a 
powerful uh, experiences here where the angelic will assist you and many, many other aspects of the prophetic and apostolic dimensions of, of the gifts of the Spirit flowing out through the body of Christ with the fivefold ministry. Those things together in intercession are very powerful of breaking down hell's gates and releasing the captives. And then finally, giving of thanks. Now, giving of thanks is mentioned last because this is the, this is the entry level for all prayer is that we enter into his gates with thanksgiving, into his courts with praise, and be thankful in him and bless his name for the Lord is good and his mercy is everlasting and his truth endures to all generations. These other channels you move in and out of, you should always be giving thanks. Everything you do, intercession with thanksgiving, prayers with thanksgiving, supplication with thanksgiving, every type every type of, of prayer also has thanksgiving there. It's the gateway that's always open. It's the dimension that's always accessible. In everything, give thanks, and for everything, gives thanks. This is something that God is always looking for, is an, a heart of thanks. So can we stop for a minute right now? Now we've kind of got a refresher on these four, and we're going to lift our hands and we're going to thank the Lord. Right now, God, we thank you that you have given us many ways to approach before you and to efficiently carry out your will. Father, we thank you for the privilege of interceding. We thank you, God, that we can come boldly before your throne to find grace to help in the time of need, not just for ourselves, but for others. That favor is a huge factor, and that favor that works in our lives is also there to work in the lives of others, that we use our favor to help others. We thank you, God, that we can walk with you in intimacy and that you care about every detail of our lives and that you whisper to us and we hear you and you are concerned about what is going on in us. And so we can cast all of our care upon you. I thank you, Father, for, for supplications, that you, you do not run away from my tears or you do not look down upon me in my anguish. You do not run away from us when we are at our weakness our weakest, but you run to us. Father, I thank you for the right and the privilege in the spirit to be able to travail until there's a transformation. And I thank you, God, that you've given us the capacity to be transformed into your likeness in Jesus' name. All right, thank the Lord for these. All right, now what he's saying is these are your four types of prayer and this is your priority. Uh, Timothy, let's go. Let's pray for what and for who? For, for kings and for all that are in authority. And what's the reason? That we may lead a quiet and peaceable life. So we are supposed to be praying for those who have authority and for those who are the kings, those who have the word, that can speak the word and change things. We are supposed to be praying for them. We're supposed to use all kinds of prayer for them, being thankful for them, interceding for them, sometimes talking to God very personally about how we are in situations with them. And then uh, there is supplications we're birthing, uh, we're, we're praying and travailing. Sometimes it's even warring uh, about it. And oftentimes it's warring because especially now for us here in North America, when you're in an election year in the United States, uh, then there, there is, a, can, is a huge battle over who has the authority. And so we are supposed to be praying for kings and for all who are in authority. In other words, those who get into authority and those who have authority, we're supposed to pray that God would direct them and guide them for this purpose, that the church can have a quiet and peaceable life. Now, this is my primary prayer that I use to say, God, help the church to be awake so that we do not have to have persecution to do your will. We're supposed to have a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. So as long as we are in all godliness and we are honest, he said, this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior. In other words, God is happy when we pray for this. He will accept this prayer. It will be received before God. And he says, why? Verse four, who will have all men to be saved. He wants everyone to be saved. Now we're going to talk about persecution in just a minute here. But persecution pushes people out of, of, the, of the place where they're being persecuted and where are they heading towards? Some place that has peace, okay? So it is in the peace places and in uh, the quiet places that it seems that more souls are supposed to be able to be saved. But if we have peace and quiet 
and we are not godly and we are not honest and we are slacking off and we are not doing the will of God and we're thinking only of ourselves and are only of our own comfort and we're not pleasing the Lord with our lifestyle, then you know what? Then, then, then there is going to be some trouble that is ahead. Now, I wanna tell you, it is impossible to escape all persecution. When I'm talking about this on this scale of 1 Timothy 2, we are talking about full-on uh, murderous uh, uh, persecution where people are being martyred in the streets and dragged into prisons and shutting down uh, the whole operation or trying to shut down the whole operation of the church. This is what Paul is praying against and talking to him to pray against because he had suffered much for the gospel. He was not afraid to suffer. Matter of fact, he gloried in his tribulations. But he is saying, we want to pray that we can do the will of God as efficiently as possible. And so now let me show you what Jesus said in Mark chapter 10. Now, this is a powerful principle here. And the disciples were astonished at his word. Verse 24, Jesus answered again and saith unto children, how hard is it for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God? So the whole world system is operating on wealth. They are all motivated and they put their faith in wealth and in riches. So everything that the world operates in is how we make our money, is, is how we uh, make our laws, and it's also how we make our war. And so how we make our money determines how we make our laws, and it's how we make war, how we fight. So in the Old Testament, it was an agrarian society. They beat their plows uh, uh, into uh, they, they they beat their plows into uh, into battle into battle gear. They took their pruning hips and stretched them, pushed them out, and made them spears. They 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 took all of their instruments of of harvesting and made them into weapons of war. And so they, they converted what they used for the ground into their so it was hand to hand and it was metal on metal. So then you see in the industrial time, in the industrial era, when we moved out of the agrarian age, which was about 5,000 years, now we go into the industrial age, which is the last 500 years. Now it's smokestack, it's, it's um, engines, it's, it's combustion, it's, it's factories, it's smoke, it's electricity. So what did we do? World War I, World War II was whoever had the best factory could produce the most tanks, could have the most bullets, could have the most guns, and whoever had the most soldiers that would all go out uniformity. Uh, and this is how we made our war. So we make laws around this. We Everything is... Now we're in the information age. So we make our war differently in the information age. 1956 is the birth of the computer era. And now everyone has a computer in their phone, an iPad, a uh, they have a, you know multiple laptops, desktops, etc. We are in the computer full-on digital age. So everything is knowledge-based. Daniel said knowledge would increase. Men would go to and fro in the earth. Now we are trying to regulate and we're trying to find out all this privacy acts. And so our warfare comes now out of this highly level, high level of digital age. So it's all about control and it's all about manipulation and it's about using uh, using the information, the, the amount of surveillance that is being done now, et cetera. We can, we can push out into this is where the battles are being faced. So how we make our money uh, is how we make our war. Everything is knowledge-based now. And so this is where, this is where we are. So everyone that trusts in, in riches, he said, uh, how hard is it them for them to enter into the kingdom? Because whatever you are, when you're in that, that ecosystem, um, uh, that's what your life consists of. Your life is about this. It's about, it's about making money. No man can serve God and mammon. Now, if you serve God, God will give you mastery over mammon, but you cannot serve mammon and also serve God. Impossible. Impossible. He says, verse 25, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. And that was the small part of the gate that they'd have to take all of their burdens off of their camels and the camel would go in and then they would bring everything else through. The, the, it was very difficult as to get on his knees and walk through. They call it the eye of the needle. Then for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God, he has to unload a whole lot of mentalities in order to enter in the kingdom of God because in the kingdom of God to, to go down, 
Uh, to go up, you go down. Uh, to be great, you serve. Uh, less is more. Uh, you lose your life to find it. Uh, you don't dominate others. It's not how many people serve you. It's how many people you can serve. And so this is a huge contrast. Uh, and, and the Bible says that here the disowned disciples were saying they were astonished out of measure, saying, who's going to be saved? Because we all want a better life. Jesus looking upon them saith, with men it is impossible, but not with God. For with God all things are possible. Then Peter began to say to them, lo, we have left all and we followed you. We left our nets. We left our business. We left our reputations. We left our hope. We left our 401k. We left our future. Everything was wrapped up in those nets and those boats. We left everything and we followed you. And Jesus answers and says, verily I say unto you, there is no man. I want you to say that. Say no man that hath left house or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children, or lands. Here's the tone. Here's the word again. For my sake. Everyone say, for my sake. And the gospels. If you do this for the sake of Jesus and the sake of the gospel, you will receive a hundredfold now in this time. Look at that. Look at houses, brethren, sisters, mothers, children, and lands. He says, but with persecutions and in the world to come, eternal life. He said, so you're going to let go of everything in this world, anything that has value or worth to you in this world, anything that would have a say or control over you in this world, you let it go. So my house is not more important. My land is not more important. Who my daddy is, my mother is, my genetic code, my mother's. Uh, my sisters, my, bro my, my whatever, mother, mother-in-law, children, anything that, that, that would make me defend myself against the conviction of the Holy Spirit. I have to leave it all. I have to let it go. And Jesus must be the Lord of my life. He must control everything in my life. Is that he is my DNA. My father is God. So whatever I get from my natural father, thank you. Whatever is good that God can use, thank you. Whatever is wrong, I do not apologize over. I do not defend. I just say, okay, take it away, God. Fix it. Remove it. Deliver me from that generational curse. Whatever comes, whatever is reinforced by my mother, well, you're just like your grandfather. Well, you're going to do just like, okay, all of those influences of family, wife and children, uh, when we become uh, parents of our, our, our own kids, suddenly we see those patterns that were in us start coming up again, and we have to renounce them. We have to break the pattern, and we have to let God's way be, be the right way, and we have to let the Word of God be our authority, and we parent the way God says parent, and we, we live our lives the way God says to live our lives. And we reinforce that and we don't let, when it shows up in our kids, we don't let it go. We, we enforce it in our kids as well. Oh my goodness, my kid's acting just like me. Oh well, you know, uh, let him be like, I had the same weakness. As, no, no, no. Hey, learn from your dad. You're not going to do the same thing that I did. You're not going to make the same mistake. So he said, we have to give it all up. We give up all of that. He's, our lands, our houses, everything. He says, you're going to have this. He said, you're going to give it all up. And you're going to have persecution. When you do it, it's not going to make sense. It's going to go against everything in the world. It's going to go against what's in the darkness. It's going to go against the selfishness. It's going to go against the wickedness. It's going to, be an, it's going to bring conviction to other people. It's going to be light shining in places that people don't always want the light to shine. And he says, so you're going to be persecuted because you refuse to go along with the world's conformity. You're not being conformed to the world. And so they're going to be persecuted by the people that are in the world and that love the world. But he says, watch this. But in this time, when you give up all of that, you're going to get something else. The kingdom is going to bring you houses and brothers and sisters and mother and children and lands. In this world, you're going to have a hundredfold blessing. Everyone say hundredfold. And so it's going to give you an access to things that you would have never had access to had you not renounced your life in this world. When you enter the kingdom, there's a whole nother ecosystem of blessing. He said, but it comes with persecution. 
in the world to come, you're going to have eternal life. Many that are first shall be last, and the last shall be first. So he's trying to explain this to them, and it's difficult for them to get this, to get their minds around persecution. Now, I'm going to go back uh, even further to an, an original teaching of Jesus that's going to help explain it, I think, just a little bit more. And then we'll move into the book of Acts for one more scripture there where we can kind of apply it. But what is the hundredfold? What is the hundredfold? Now, in a practical sense, a hundredfold return on my investment in the kingdom of God. What does that mean? What does that really mean? It does not mean that I'm going to get a hundred. Everyone gets a hundred houses. Everyone gets a hundred acres, you know, for every one acre of land that you give up. It doesn't mean that God gives you a hundred mamas. It doesn't mean that your family, you know, no, 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 that, that's, it's, it's not it, it, in a practical sense. Try to try to even figure that out. It wouldn't work. What it means is that in the kingdom of God is that we have all things common is that in the kingdom of God, I may have a mortgage that I'm paying on my house, but there are a hundred other houses that I could go to right now of people of God that I could knock on their door and I could walk in and I could sit down with them and they would feed me out of their refrigerator and they would give me a cup of coffee, okay? And there are a hundred people that could come to my house that I would know and I've had hundreds of people in my home and I would feed them and take care of them. Why? Because it's not because they're my blood family, it's because they're a part of the body of Christ. It's because they're in the kingdom and I share the same affinity. I have the same name now, the name of Jesus. I have the same experience, the Holy Ghost. I have the same Father, which is God. I know what it means. I know what it means to be born again. And when you've been born again, we share an affinity and a connection and a brotherhood that is absolutely, uh, that is absolutely uh, trans, uh, transcendent. I told this story when I went to Ethiopia and I got off the bus and a man standing there putting his hand over his heart and a tears coming down his face and he hugs me and tears come down my face and I take my hand over my heart. We don't have the same language, but I was like, I just met another brother. Oh my goodness, this is one of my brothers. This is my Ethiopian brother. And I was so happy to see him like I had known him my whole life and I hugged him because I felt the love of God so strong in my life. When I evangelized, I had families that took me in. I stayed with them. No, don't stay in a hotel. We want you to stay with us. I, they got my picture up on their wall because I became a part of their family. Every year I was there for a couple of weeks and we just, we connected. We did life together. Uh, seven or eight years in a row, I did a revival for them and I just became just so close to them. This is the body of Christ. This is what he is saying. When you give up all of that in this world, this is what you find. You have hundreds of houses and lands and brothers and sisters and you have mothers to mother you and fathers to father you and you have spiritual children uh, that, 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 that you, it's all of it. This is what you get. And he says, so, the, so you're gonna have this abundance of, of family and, and kingdom he said, but there's going to be persecution because the world simply cannot relate to that. It does not compute. It does not relate. And it does not make sense to them. It's backwards. Now, let us look at the opening dialogue that Jesus gave us. And I want to give you a new definition of blessing. And I want to talk to you about persecution from the concept of blessing. Now, you probably haven't had anybody teach it like this before. If you have, I'm so happy. But this is something that God has showed me. Uh, and I did some research uh, with Spiros Zeodiades, um, Greek Hebrew key study Bible. And this is kind of where the original seed thought came from. And I would have never found this if I hadn't been studying Greek. But the word blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are they that mourn. Uh, Matthew chapter five, starting with verse three. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the peacemakers. All of these words blessed in the Greek are progressive. What he is saying is that as he begins, he is starting at the, at the entry level of blessing. So as you start the first, the, the first entrance into the kingdom of heaven, he said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. There are two Greek words for poor. One is someone who does not have wealth, but knows how to take care of himself. 
So he can, he's able to work, he doesn't, but he doesn't have wealth. There's another word for poor, which means completely helpless, does not have any resources and cannot work, cannot help himself. The word poor in spirit here is the more extreme of those words. It means that you are completely helpless. You cannot help yourself. Blessed are those who are spiritually helpless. And he said, when you come to God, you realize you are completely empty. You cannot save yourself. You cannot help yourself. You cannot make yourself righteous. And he said, that's the blessedness. That is a state of being blessed is that when you realize I am spiritually poor, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So God opens the kingdom when we first empty ourselves. And that is our, that is the beginning of blessing. If you want to break the curse, you have to first start with this state, this vulnerable place of pouring yourself out before God, emptying yourself out before God and say, and realizing I am nothing without him. Aren't you thankful right now? Aren't you thankful right now? That when we are completely lost, that he comes and rescues us. Father, I thank you that when I am completely helpless, when I am so poor that I cannot pay for the wages of my sin, you went to the cross for me and you died for me. I thank you, Father, that you paid the price. You, 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 were, you were able, you were able and you were willing to do it for us in Jesus' name. Can you thank the Lord for it right now? I'm gonna go a little bit faster through these others and I wanna show you the progression, the meek, okay, the hunger and thirst, those who thung, hunger and thirst, merciful. Now, pure in heart, by the time you get to verse nine, it's not just what you lack, it's now what is coming into you, what you're beginning to do. You are now a peacemaker. From being a peacemaker, so let's look at the progression, poor in spirit, those that mourn, we mourn for what we've done that's wrong. We mourn for our, our mistakes, for our failures. We, we mourn, we mourn over, over our lack. And he says, but you're going to be comforted. There's a change coming into your life. Now there's a meekness. Number three is the meekness. You, you, you're not trying to go after all of these things. You're not aggressive. You're, you're changing. You're, your strength is under control. Now there's a meekness. There's something that's come to you where there's a shift where you are not aggressive, where you're not retaliatory, you are not easily offended, you are not, you're, 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 you're not creating division, you're meek. He says, you're going to inherit the earth. Everyone else is going to destroy themselves and you're just going to be standing there and you'll be able to walk in and, and inherit the earth after they're done. And so he says, that's what's going to happen. You're going to inherit the earth. The meek will, uh, not, not the violent. The violent won't inherit the earth. The meek will inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst. Now there's an appetite for righteousness. He said, you're going to get filled with righteousness. Now that you're filled with righteousness, what is this? Now you begin to be merciful for you, you become merciful. You've had mercy given to you. Now you have mercy in you. You are full of mercy, full of righteousness. Do you see the progression? Now you're able to give mercy to others. From there, you have a pure heart. Your heart has been purified before God, and now you can see God. You have revelation. You have insight. You, you, you begin to see things in the kingdom. The pure in heart, your motives have changed. Your, your heart is pure. You want only the things that God wants. You're righteous, and from that righteousness, the pure in heart causes you then to be able to see clearly. You're navigating now in the kingdom. The resources are plain. The understanding of the word of God is there. The principles are operating in your life. You're in the flow you're in the flow of this. You're going to see God. That's a reward of the pure in heart. Now you're a peacemaker. You literally have power to come in and change environments, to change atmospheres. You come in and make peace. That is power. That is true power with God. And you're going to say, wow, you're the child of God. Only a child of God could come into this environment and bring peace to it. Do you see this? So now what's the highest progression past a peacemaker? Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Wait, wait, look at verse 11. The highest level of, of blessing. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely 
for my sake, not for your sake, but for my sake. When the nature of Christ is so evident in you, when, when, you are, when you are so full of Jesus, the salt is so salty. The light is so bright. Okay, rejoice, he says, and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. So speaking of these terms, notice you're the salt of the earth, verse 13, Verse 14, you're the light of the world. So this is the context of persecution. is because you are salty. It's because you are light. It's because you've come to maturity. So when you are mature, it is impossible for you to be in an environment and not create an opposite. When you are not mature, the environment is kind of flowing in and out. It's kind of hitting you and you're still in that state of trying to reconcile. You're still trying to develop. You're still trying to grow. But, I, but I'm telling you that, that there, is, there is something that has happened. There's a formation that happens is that as we see the church getting stronger, as we see the conviction becoming, becoming more obvious, and as people are praying and people are fasting, we won't bend, we won't break, we won't compromise, we won't back down, we won't change. It doesn't matter what you say about me. It doesn't matter what you think about me. I know who I am. I know what God has called me to do. I know why I'm here, and I'm gonna keep doing it. And if it costs me, it costs me. When you get to that point, place in your life, that's when it is full on, uh, that is, it is full on war. It is full on battle. It is a, it is a direct now, now it is no longer the enemy is operating in persecution. Now all he has left is accusation. So the, the, the highest level of spiritual warfare is when you are being accused. And so what did the Bible say in the book of revelations? And the accuser of the brethren is cast down, and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. I kept my testimony. I didn't break down under the persecution. So in this information age, what is the war? The war, we're being persecuted right now by shutting down our posts, by, by, by uh, uh, silencing certain voices, by, by uh, shaming you for standing up for things, but you know all of this hate police that is out there calling it hate uh, uh, hate speech or whatever. You cannot even read the Bible and tell someone they're a sinner without that being hate speech. So, folks, uh, nothing can be wrong anymore. Nobody can be wrong. Nothing. There cannot be any principle where we say what is right or what is wrong because it's only what's relative to you. And what happens is they keep pushing the line. How far are they going to push it? Folks, they're already pushing it now that homosexuality is not enough. Now they want to say that it's okay for pedophiles. They just want to defend the pedophile. And, and so what? we just have to accept this because they were born this way. Folks, this is the world. This is the world. Uh, in the days of Lot, here is one man standing up and just saying, no, you're not going to do that. And they beat down his door and tried to kill him. In this generation that we live in today, men love darkness because their deeds are evil. And when you start shining a light, people don't like that. Persecution comes from people that have already been convicted. It comes from people that already feel the pain of truth that has hit them and they don't want to change. And so what they want to do is instead silence the voice. And they think if I can shut you up, then the conviction uh, won't ring in my ears anymore and I can go on doing what I want to do and get away with it. And so so this is, this is where we are today, where it, there, there, there are, there's going to be extremes. What we are warring for is everyone caught in the middle. Because there are many people that are being influenced one way or the other. And they're trying to decide what is right and what is wrong. And where do they fit? And they want to do what is good and what is right. But they also have the flesh and the permissiveness of the age is, is leading them towards that temptation. And so we have this pulling back and forth and this wavering. And on one side is there's is extreme wickedness 
that is trying to entangle the entire world and control the entire world and an antichrist system that is being built all around the world to control and to manipulate and, 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 and to, and to pe- keep everyone in line, to make everyone conform. And if you don't conform, there is the group think. There is the, I mean, there is this powerful repercussion that you're going to suffer. I mean, the peer pressure is going to be so intense. You know, I told that story about when we first were coming into the pandemic and I walked into Walmart and I had gloves because I was thinking this would be better. Don't touch a surface or whatever. And but I I just scratched my nose and somebody, oh, my goodness, you touched your face. And they were yelling at me out in the parking lot because I touched my face. I mean, I didn't even it wasn't like I even touched my nose. I just touched my face. And he's yelling at me. It's, this is what we have, this pressure, be not conformed. There's this conforming, you will, you will, you will, you will. And then the laws that are being passed and the, and, and, and everywhere is the plexiglass. Is, ah, you will conform, you will break. Okay, that's the system. There's a system behind that. And there's a lot of well-meaning people there that are doing the best they can to try to help people that are right in the middle of all of that and that, and that we are desperately praying for and caring about and interested in. And then there's this other side that is saying, you know what, we have to operate and function in the will of God. And, and we have to pray for as many people to be helped and to be delivered and to be free. And that sh- and you shall know the truth and the truth will make you free. And it's just because you don't know and you don't have answers and you're in the dark. And so what's going to happen is they're going to say, don't listen to them. And they're going to try to shut you down because what happens every time the gospel comes, it changes people. It changes their life. It changes the way you live. It changes where you go. It changes your friends. It changes what you like and what you don't like. It changes how how you dress. It changes everything. When the demoniac was delivered, he, he was naked when he was delivered. As soon as he gets healed, he's dressed and he is his right mind. And now he starts a newspaper. The Bible says he begins to publish abroad the testimony. I'm, that's a stretch. But my point is he began to be a missionary. He totally changed. It's a complete 180. And so when you change, sometimes not everybody wants you to change. And so they're going to fight you over that. There's going to be persecution over that. And so, but I want you to understand that persecution is a reflection of a, of a positive change that has happened in your life when it's for the gospel's sake and when it's for the sake of Jesus. He said, you need to rejoice and be exceeding glad for great is your reward in heaven. Great, rejoice. I remember I was dealing with a particular church for, for a season and uh, I had some people there that just really didn't like me and they, and they worked against me and they talked against me. And no matter what I would do or what I would say, I tried to even go to them and talk to them. And there was nothing that I could say or do to change their mind. And I'm the kind of person, my personality type is, I want everyone to like me. That's just my personality type. It bothers me when people uh, don't like me. I think I, we ought to be able to fix this. We ought to be able to go and sit down and talk about it. And, and if, if I did something wrong, I'll own it and, and we'll fix it and we'll make it right. But I couldn't hardly handle this, this whole thing. But I couldn't put my finger on what did I do. It was the fact that I was preaching a change. It was the fact that I was messing with tradition. It was the fact that their power base was being disrupted. And they knew They knew that they were wrong, but they didn't want to admit that they were wrong. They knew that that the change needed to happen, but they didn't want the change because it meant for them they would lose a certain amount of control or power or influence, and they feared or they had a bad experience or whatever, fill in the blank. And so they were, I was enemy number one because I was preaching a change. And so I remember uh, standing on the platform in the middle of the worship service and, and I was still just grieving over this because I could feel this element of people in this church that just, there was another section that was totally, I mean, thriving as I was ministering. But this, it just bothered me. It bothered me. And all of a sudden, the Lord spoke to me and he said, woe unto you when all men speak well of you, for so did they, the false prophets. He said, he said everyone's not supposed to like you. You're so, he said, this means that you have a real ministry. You're really operating in the prophetic if people are resisting you. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. He said, I told you to rejoice. I told you to get happy. I didn't tell you to be grieved about it. I'm like, oh God, you know, these people, they're saying things and I know that, you know, it makes me feel bad. That's nothing but pride. 
That's nothing but pride. And, and, and that's nothing but immaturity on my part. And that's nothing but, but a lack of perspective. You know, he says, rejoice, rejoice and be glad. So I got up and I started saying, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, people are fighting me. Thank you, God, people don't like me. Thank you, God, people are saying bad stuff about me. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. I, I thank you, Lord. I, must, I must be onto something. I must be really touching something in the spirit. Thank you, God. And when I did that, something broke off of me. And when it broke off of me, guess what? It started to break off of them. And they started coming around. I had to go through the persecution to get the breakthrough. I had to go to the persecution to go to the next level. Accusation is the last level before promotion. Accusation is the last level before promotion. I'm going to say it one more time. Accusation is the last level before promotion. So you start with ignorance. You don't know what you're fighting with. Then you meet your adversary and he tries to do one of two things. There is an intimidation stage. There's a fear stage. And then if you get past the fear stage or when you get past the fear stage, then he goes to the deception stage where he tries to deceive you. If you're not ignorant any longer, if you're not intimidated anymore, if you cannot be deceived, all he has left then is to try to undermine your character, to try to destroy your influence by bringing accusations. I'm going to try to undermine you because you can't be deceived. You can't be intimidated. You can't be stopped. You know what I'm doing. You, you've exposed me. And so this is all I've got left is to try to point a finger, is to try to accuse you. And so accusation is that last step. When you break through the accusation, you go to a new level of authority. So I don't plead innocent. I don't plead guilty. Everyone say it with me. I just plead the blood. Lift your hands right now and thank him in Jesus' name. Father, I thank you for the progression of blessing in our lives right now. I thank you for the progression of blessings. I thank you, Lord Jesus, that we are, we are becoming more and more like you. I thank you, Father, that you are giving us strength, that you are giving us help, and that you're going to help us to suffer as a Christian, to suffer because of the gospel. We're going to suffer persecution because of your sake. I thank you, God. I thank you for the privilege of serving you. Now, as I promised you, I'm going to give you a text in the book of Acts. We're going to look at Acts chapter 4. I think I said 5, but let's look at the end of chapter... Oh, no, I think it is chapter 5. I'm sorry. I think I was right originally. Yes, chapter 5. And verse number 26, and when the captain was with the officers and brought them without violence, for they feared the people, lest they should have been stoned. And when they had brought them, he set them before the council, and the high priest asked them, did not we strictly command you that you should not teach in this name? And behold, you filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. And Peter and the other apostles answered, we ought to obey God rather than man. And then the God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you slew and hanged on a tree. Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior, for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses of these things. And so is also the Holy Ghost, which God has given to them that obey him. And when they heard that, they were cut to the heart and they took counsel to slay them. They were convicted and then they said, let's kill them. Okay, and so then they talked amongst themselves and Gamaliel said, refrain from these men and let them alone. Verse 38, for if this counsel or this work be of men, it will come to naught. But if it be of God, we cannot overthrow it. Lest happily we be found to even fight against God. And to him they agreed. Now watch, look what they did. And when they had called the apostles and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and they let them go. And they departed from the presence of the council. Verse 41, rejoicing. Everyone say rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And daily in the temple and in every house, they cease not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. You can't stop them. All you can do is accuse them. And they blew through that in Jesus' name with their obedience and their boldness. And they beat them. That's all that's left. Now, if I can't accuse you, now all I can do is try to cause you physical harm. I got to try to kill you because I can't stop you. 
It is, it is an indication of the effectiveness. They filled Jerusalem with their doctrine. That is when we're effective. When I was in Ethiopia, they told me, when they read the text about with persecution, houses and lands and mothers and fathers, uh, I'll give you 100 fold with persecution. They said, if we don't have persecution, it means that we're not praying and we're not fasting and, and we're, we're, not, we're not really doing the work that God's called us to do. Oh my goodness, it's too calm. We're not being persecuted. That was the attitude in, in Ethiopia. That was their spirit. And I thought, wow, how amazing is that? How amazing is their spirit? God dealt with me a long time ago about this. And I was having a really hard time. I'm just being really transparent with you as we're closing today. I was, very, I was having a very big time with this whole idea of suffering. I didn't want to suffer. I was afraid of suffering. I was afraid of the pain. I was afraid of what it was, what, how it would happen. How much can I handle? What are they going to say? What are they going to do to me? I don't know if I can deal with this. And God kept asking me, are you willing to suffer for me? And I, I, God, I, I, okay, just, I, I don't know how, you, how to respond to that. I, I want to be willing, but I, I don't feel very willing. And so for six months, I wrestled with this until finally I stopped and I said, okay, God, if you want me to suffer, I'll suffer, but I need you to give me your mindset on suffering. And this is what he told me. He said, you need to, have a, you need to look to the apostles for your example. They rejoiced when they were suffering. Acts 5.41, they rejoiced that they were counted worthy. And he said, when that is your attitude, then, then you are ready to endure suffering when that's your attitude. Rejoice and be exceeding glad. Folks, when they persecute us and we rejoice, what can you do with that? There's a great famous story um, of, the early, of the early church. It's in a, it's in a, um, a historical document in which they were going to kill 40 Christians on the ice. They were going to make them take all their clothes off and they pushed them out into the ice and for them to freeze to death. And here they were. Uh, I believe it was actually 38 of them were out there and there were two soldiers uh, that were, that were uh, sent to, to make them suffer this way. And they were out there on the ice and they were singing. They were singing together. They were huddled up. We're about to go to heaven. We're out here on the ice. We're, we're going to die. We're all going to die. We're all going to freeze. We're, we're not very far away. Let's just sing our way into heaven. And they just began to sing and sing and sing and sing and worship and rejoice. And then they slowly began to fall and began to die. And they were singing and they were singing. And one of the soldiers was so moved by the song, he started taking off his clothes and walking out. And he said, I'm going to go die with them. I want whatever they've got. And, and the last man is standing there, out there, standing there watching them. And finally, uh, I'm not sure who gave the testimony or the record of it or who heard it, but um, he was out there uh, on the ice and died with them. Uh, he would rather die a martyr's death because he saw the incredible rejoicing and celebration it was said that Paul ran to the chopping block. He ran because I'm just one chop away from going to heaven. So folks, we have to realize our reward is not only in this world. We have houses and lands. We have access to the whole resources of the kingdom, but our reward is reserved for heaven. Amen. And we want to take as many people with us as we can. Father, we just come to you today and we just ask you, give us grace for what's coming. Prepare us for what's coming. When they revile us, when they say evil against us falsely, when they accuse us, when they try to shut us down, if there is physical harm that is coming, we don't know what's coming. We don't know what's happening in this age. We want there to be more peace. We want there to be a more space of grace. We are praying, oh God, that the church can be effective without having to be persecuted and spread all through the world uh, because we're, we're running from persecution. Rather, we would, we'd rather be effective in the networks with the friendships in the communities that we're already in. And we want to we want to see great revival and outpouring of the Holy Spirit. We want to see all men to be saved. That's what you said, that we thrive best in a quiet and peaceable life. And this is what we ask. But Lord, we pray in Jesus name when we are so strong, when our faith is so high, when the light is shining so bright, when the salt is so savory, when the nature of Christ is so evident 
that people begin to resist us and fight against us, Lord. Give us the incredible grace, oh God, to say what you would say and do what you would do. Help us, oh God, to overcome evil with good. Oh God, help us in the name of Jesus to rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is our reward in heaven. Amen. Amen. Well, today uh, was somewhat of a sobering thought, but I hope I've encouraged you and not made you um, uh, and not made you more concerned. But I want to just tell you that God is with all of us, and uh, God is with all of us. We just walk in the Spirit. And you know what? We're going to be victorious and we're going to operate like the apostles operated. God's going to use us in extraordinary ways in Jesus' name. And God bless all of you today and we will see you tomorrow.